principally because of ideological differences. So the first thing that you need to know about is the differences between the beliefs of the United States and the Soviet Union. So the United States is capitalist and a democracy. The USSR is communist and a dictatorship. The key problem that they have is they both think the other ideology is determined to destroy them. So the Soviet Union think that capitalism is designed to destroy communism and the capitalists think that communism is trying to take over the world. So they both don't trust each other and some of that <coughs> trust is not just ideological, it's not just about what they believe, it's also about what's happened in the past. So when the Russian Revolution happens, the Americans try to destroy communism. In the First World War, the Russians pull out the First World War, which causes problems from America. And in the Second World War, in the Second World War, the Russians think the Americans haven't helped them enough. So even before the Cold War begins, in the course of, as we study it, these two countries don't trust each other. And there's problems in their relationship, if you like, between the two states. Now that's continued in the first major meeting that you need to know about for your exam, which is at the Yalta Conference, between these, principally between these three men. So there's Winston Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin. Okay, and they agree several things. They agree they're going to split Germany into four, they're going to split, split Berlin into four, and those four bits are going to be run by these three countries and also by the French, who are going to get a bit of Berlin and a bit of Germany to administer. The other thing they're going to do is they're going to have free elections in Eastern Europe, they're going to set up the United Nations, they're going to have reparations, so Germany's going to have to pay money uh, mostly to Russia to uh, rebuild Russia, and they're also um, going to put Nazi war criminals on trial. At this meeting, their relationship is okay. They're able to work together. They don't totally trust each other, so Stalin put bugs in the rooms of these individuals, but they kind of work together. What then happens is they meet again later in 1945 at Potsdam in Germany. By this time, their relationship has totally changed. So, you'll notice that Roosevelt is no longer there. He's died. Truman replaces him. And very surprisingly, Winston Churchill lost an election in Britain and was replaced by Clement Attlee. Now, at Potsdam, they basically agree everything that they agreed before at Yalta, apart from there's a couple of problems. The lead, individually, these guys don't get on very well. Truman isn't really prepared to do any negotiating with Stalin. The atom bomb has been dropped on Japan, and Stalin is frightened of that, and Truman knows that he's going to try and use the bomb to get more things out of Stalin. And also, the Russian army is in Eastern Europe and in Poland and isn't allowing free elections and isn't really prepared to in the way that America understands it. And that means that by Potsdam, the Cold War probably has begun and these countries don't, uh, their relationship has broken down even more. As I said a moment ago, that's all made worse by the atom bomb, which effectively ended the Second World War, but could also be seen as the start of the Cold War. So there's two atomic explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where in total over 200,000 Japanese die. And what this shows is American power, and it makes Stalin, who's a paranoid individual anyway, even more scared even more scared for his future and the future of his country. And Truman doesn't really help out the situation by being prepared to negotiate a Potsdam using the atomic bomb. Okay. At the same time as all of that's going on, the Russian army, the Red Army, has been invading Eastern Europe to defeat the Nazis. This map shows some of that. And through 1944, 45, 46, the Red Army has gone into Poland, Hungary, <coughs> Romania, bits of Czechoslovakia, to start with freeing those peoples and then beginning to set up communist governments, or certainly when they allow elections, making sure they quite closely control those. So in Poland, for example, Stalin very carefully controls who's able to vote in what elections and who they're able to vote for. And that occupation of Eastern Europe, Stalin thinks is necessary to protect himself after the dropping of the atomic bomb, 
and also he kind of thinks he's owed because of the amount of people from the Soviet Union who've been killed in the Second World War. The Americans think he's trying to form an empire and they therefore their kind of trust breaks down even more. And after the Potsdam Conference, when elections are held in some of these countries, what the communists do there is they form coalition governments to start with. So communists share power with other groups. And, but the communists are quite clever. They do things like make sure they control the police and organisations that mean they can then gradually take over the whole country. And through a use of coalitions and kind of terror tactics, Stalin's able to take control of all of these countries. The exception is Czechoslovakia, which is kind of a free country until 1948, when the communists take over in a military coup, like a military takeover by force, which includes, you might remember, Jan Masirat being thrown out of a window in Prague. He was a, an enemy, like an opponent of the communists, who was killed by the KGB and Stalin's operatives, I suppose, as Czechoslovakia also became communist. And what that does is that then annoys the Americans. And the Americans then see Stalin as an aggressor, and they then act against him. And the whole start of the Cold War is kind of like a bit of a tit for tat. One country does one thing, then the next country does the next thing, and they kind of constantly are annoying each other, and their trust is getting worse and worse as the Cold War progresses. Earlier today, I completely forgot to mention the Iron Curtain. So here I am at my house with an iron, a curtain, and a small figure of Yoda who is taking the role of Winston Churchill. In 1946, shortly before the Truman Doctrine was announced, Winston Churchill gave a speech in Fulton, Missouri, which he announced that an iron curtain had descended across Europe. Here, he was talking about the division of Europe between communism and capitalism. Stalin interpreted this, interpreted this as an aggressive action. Churchill was not even Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time, but nonetheless, Stalin thought of him as an important character, and thus, Europe was divided into two armed camps. The Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, Comic-Con and Cominform only made this situation worse. Now, the Americans, at kind of as this is going on, and just before Czechoslovakia, are trying to stop Stalin spreading his ideology, spreading communism. The first thing they do to do that is introduce this thing, which is the document here, which is called the Truman Doctrine. And the Truman Doctrine basically says that Truman, the President of the United States, will do anything to stop the spread of communism. And firstly, he's worried about two countries. He's worried about Greece and Turkey. And the first thing he does to help those two countries is give them money and weapons. And the money and weapons are designed to stop communism spreading. And that, as lots of you know, is $400 million worth of aid um, and weapons equivalent. Okay? Uh, and at the same time... We'll edit that later. At the same time as all of that happening, an American general called George Marshall has gone to Europe to do a kind of survey of what's going on. And he goes around Western Europe and basically says, this is a mess. All these countries are struggling because of the war. Loads of countries have got communist groups that are beginning to become quite people popular because people are so desperate. And he says the only way that America are going to be able to stop communism spreading across all of Europe is to give people money and, and goods to help them rebuild. So what Marshall does is, like the Truman Doctrine, um, similarly, he gives 15 to 17 billion dollars of aid. Now that doesn't come in cash. The Americans don't give out gold or money. What they mostly give is goods. So food, coal, products. And around this area in Stenning, things like agricultural machinery is given to farmers to help them make more money or to help the country recover. And that's, the mar that's called the Marshall Plan, which is another attempt to do what Truman's setting out to do, which is contain communism. And you sometimes see that called containment. Now, after all of that, Stalin then is annoyed by that. He reacts with his own approach to that. So he introduces something called Common Form and Comic Con, which are basically communist versions of those two things. Uh, they're not quite as effective as the Marshall Plan and Marshall Aid, mostly because Stalin hasn't got as much money or as much stuff to give out to the communist countries. And also because the Americans are quite clever, they offer lots of money and goods to the communist countries as well. And some of those want to take it. One of them is Czechoslovakia, 
which is then taken over by the communists, and the other one is Yugoslavia, which um, decides that instead of um, being communist and listening to Stalin, <coughs> they're going to be communist, but also take money from America. And they end up then being a bit of a funny country that is communist, but also sometimes an ally of the Americans. And their leader is quite a famous individual called Marshal Tito. And um, then this picture here, is of the Berlin, is of what then happened in Berlin in 1948, when Stalin decides that because of all of that American aggression, as he sees it, where the Americans are giving lots of money to Europe and trying to take over using money, but what Stalin's going to do um, is try to get hold of Berlin. And so he shuts off Berlin, he blockades it, he cuts off all the canals, all the roads, all the railways, um, and Berlin's a bit stuck because it's 160 kilometres away from anywhere else that's capitalist. So they're kind of isolated, like in this sea of communism, if you like. And the Americans and British and French have particularly annoyed Stalin because in West Berlin they've given them even more money and their own currency and united the zones into something called Trisania. So Stalin tries to get Berlin. He offers people in um, West Berlin extra money and rations if they come over to his side. And basically it totally fails. Because what the Americans um, and... Going the wrong way again, I forget how many pictures... What the Americans and British um, do is they fly in supplies. So thousands of tons of coal and food and all kinds of different supplies flown into West Berlin um, to keep the people alive. And a very small amount of people defect and go to the east, um, but then Stalin eventually has to give up. He can't shoot any planes down because it would be an act of war and he doesn't quite have an atom bomb yet. The Americans then do is they're really scared um, because of the Berlin blockade and airlift. They think that's aggressive. The Germans are scared and Europe is scared. And Europe kind of ask America whether they can form an alliance to protect themselves. It's particularly pertinent at the moment in the news, actually. Um, and they form something called NATO. And in NATO, initially, there are uh, 12 members. And West Germany only joined that in 1955. But the 12 members of NATO are set up really to protect capitalist countries from Stalin and from um, communist aggression. And that becomes particularly important when um, Stalin also tests his first atomic bomb. In 1949. And then when the arms race gets even worse with the invention of hydrogen bombs, which are 2,000 times more popular, uh, more popular, more powerful than the atom bomb, and, and attested by the Americans in 1952 and the Russians in 1953. Um, and then last, last little bit here, what the Cold War then, so that all of that is about Europe. All of that really is about what's going on, particularly around Germany between East and West Europe. What then happens at the end of this unit is we have to study a little bit to do with Asia. And that Asia becomes a particular part of the Cold War when China becomes communist in 1949. And this is Chairman Mao, who's the leader of that um, communist state. And what that does in America is makes people think communism spreading even more. We should be really, really scared of it. And, and that's made worse when in 1950 the North Koreans invade South Korea. Now this is a little bit of a jump in geography. The North Koreans are communist, the South Koreans are capitalist. And in the same way that Germany was split into bits, Korea was also split into bits um, at the Yalta Conference. And so when the North invade the South, the Americans think this is a sign that communism's taken over the world. And in America at this time, there's something called the Red Scare, where people are really panicking about communism taking over the world, basically. And so the Americans um, encourage um, the United Nations to send soldiers to fight against the North Koreans to stop the spread of communism. And it's important that you know some of the events to do with um, which countries provided which troops and then the involvement of the Chinese, I suppose, is important, that the Chinese send then extra troops into Korea. What all this leads to is there's an American general who wants to attack China called General MacArthur. And this shows us something important, I suppose, about Truman. And Truman is not prepared for that to happen because it would have been too dangerous and perhaps created a, a nuclear war. So Truman sacks MacArthur and replaces him with General Ridgeway. The picture of the dominoes is because what the Americans are worried about is the spread of communism, the domino theory, I suppose.
And then we end this unit with the death, of course, of Joseph Stalin in 1953 and the change in nature of the Cold War, maybe, under Nikita Khrushchev. Because the very famous speech in 1956 saying two things, that he's going to make sure the world is kind of more peaceful with an idea called peaceful coexistence and also that Russia is going to become uh, slightly different under him when he talks about something called de-Stalinization and those are two terms you need to know for your exam. And what we also need to understand is that Khrushchev kind of means that and kind of doesn't. So there's some really good examples of him making the world better and more peaceful like the Austrian State Treaty where Austria becomes independent and neutral, like the fact Khrushchev goes to America and actually meets with President Eisenhower. But there's also lots of examples of Khrushchev being just as aggressive as Stalin. He builds more weapons, he competes in sports, um, he shoots down spy planes, um, he's very aggressive in the way he talks about capitalism. So the Cold War changes when Stalin dies and Khrushchev takes over, but perhaps not as well as um, sometimes we might think. And then my last picture, this is Sputnik in 1957, which shows exactly that. Khrushchev wanting to compete with the Americans by building missiles and, and ultimately spacecraft. Okay? Done, Henry. <laughs>